how many are ready today for, I don't know, maybe a little bit difficult of a message? Okay, all right, got a few people. Um, others are squirming maybe in their seats, but hey, I, I was uh, just telling Lauren this this morning that um, I read uh, an article a couple weeks ago, and in the article it was talking about pastors in America are having a hard time actually preaching the Word of God and actually having a hard time preaching the truth of God's Word, especially in our culture today. And the article was really calling pastors back to arms, back to the true pulpit, and back to preaching the Word of God. Um, you know, a lot of people today want fluff and stuff. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little fluff and stuff here and there. But there are times that the church has to actually hear the harder things of God's Word. How many of you understand that right now we live in a, in, a, in a period of time of God's grace, right? Of God's love, and He's reaching out. But on the flip side of that, we don't ever want to talk about this. All of this period of grace is going to come to an end, and then judgment is coming. It's coming. But we want to push that off like it's never going to happen. And a lot of times as we push that off like it's never going to happen, sometimes our life becomes compromised. Come on, it's true. Our life becomes compromised in walking it out for God. And so today's going to be kind of a challenging message. I like challenging messages personally because I get to hear it before you do, and I get to work through things that God's challenging me in my own life. And so I hope today you won't listen, and while you're listening, uh, get so squirmish that you won't look at it in the reality of it and really test yourself and test your heart this morning, that God may be able to speak to you what you need to hear this morning for good or maybe a little harder. Maybe, he's, maybe he needs to tell you today, hey, wake up. The time is near. Okay. And so, you know, we were talking in the last three weeks leading up to Christmas, uh, we were talking about um, there was uh, a time, that three weeks ago, the message was on uh, waiting. All the prophecies that was spoken all took time to wait for Jesus Christ to be fulfilled. John the Baptist came and his message was about preparation. And then last week we talked about Jesus being born um, and all the wonderful gifts he gave us when he was born. Well, today... We want to um, take a look at, now that Christ has been born, now we're back into a, another waiting period. Are you following me? We're now waiting for Christ's return. But how are we living during this time of waiting? How are we living as believers now after Christ is born, after, after he died and, and was resurrected and sits at the right hand of the Father, after the fact that the Holy Spirit has been released now to fill our lives and to empower us to live the very life that God's given us to live, how are we living that out? Do you understand why this could be a little difficult today? You know, a little challenging? God's good. And we're going we're gonna to learn today the reason why God's delayed, why God is delaying, because God is delaying. Because sometimes his heart's bigger than our heart. Sometimes our, sometimes our hearts aren't lined up with his heart. Because sometimes I hear comments from Christians that say this, I just can't, I wish the Lord would just wrap this world up right now and call it an end. That comment doesn't reveal the heart of God. It reveals the heart of people who want to escape from difficulty. If God was about escaping his people from difficulty, he would have never had 12 disciples because they went through difficulty, a lot of difficulty. Most of them were martyred. Most of them were killed. Now, thank God we don't live in that area today. Can I hear an amen? But who knows what that's going to look like in 10 years? We know persecution of Christians is ramping up in other places of the world. We don't know if it's going to come to our doorsteps in America. But throw that, that aside, how are you living today in this period of waiting? You know, we sang a song today that Jesus is our hope. 
Yes, we look to Jesus. Jesus isn't the hope who we were looking for to come. He's already come. But we're looking now to the skies for his return. How many are ready for his return? How many are really prepared for him to come back? So let's, let's uh, look at a, a scripture this morning. It's a fa- fairly lengthy one, um, but we're going to break it all down and have some fun this morning. Amen? All right, here we go. Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13. And this is out of the New Living Translations. It says, the, the, king of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is, will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, everybody say delayed, they all, can you say all? And I just want to point that out so we don't get puffed up, right? (laughs) They all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were aroused by a shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourself. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or hour of my return. What sobering words as they get back, knock on the door, and cry out for Lord, Lord. And his reply was, I never knew you. They missed the second coming. So there's a lot in here, and we're going to break it down, but let's pray first. Father, we come before you right now in the precious name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that pre-service prayer and worship has filled this place uh, to, to the top of the rafters with your presence. And so, Father, I pray that you rest upon each and every one of us. That, Father, you would open all of our ears to hear what your spirit says um, today and what your scripture is speaking. And, and, Father, give me the grace to do it in such a way that's easy to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's start breaking down this, this passage of scripture. So first, it starts out, the kingdom of heaven is like. So if you ever read the Gospels and you see that phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, it's a good idea to maybe understand what it's saying because Jesus is speaking something very clearly at the time, but it's very important. The kingdom of heaven is like. So this one is the, the kingdom of heaven is like these 10, ten, ten bride, bridesmaids. So the cast of this is we have a, a, a bridegroom who is Jesus. We have uh, bridesmaids. Um, we have five that are foolish, which I put them into the realm of unbelievers. And then we have five who are wise, who are believers. Okay, are you following me? So all 10 of the bridesmaids had lamps, and those lamps needed oil. Now all 10 of them fell asleep. Are you listening? The five that were foolish fell asleep. The five that had oil also fell asleep. And then we have the time of waiting. The time of waiting in in this passage. They're waiting for the bridegroom to come. And that's where we are today. So the bridegroom comes. And we have five of those bridesmaids that were wise. And they went in and ate dinner with the bridegroom. The five that were foolish went and had to go get more oil for their lamp, and they missed the dinner. That's a bummer. You know, I don't like missing dinner on a typical typical day. Anybody? Anybody like missing dinner? I don't like missing dinner. But I really don't like it when it's a special dinner, because that's usually when there's special meat on the table. <laughs> Amen? So... Let's, let's understand something really quick right now about Jewish 
weddings. So in this time that Jesus um, is speaking this to his crowd, this would be kind of the typical way a marriage would work. Okay, so you have the bridegroom. He would actually be doing his house, getting his house ready for his for his bride to be. Okay, so he'd be working, getting all set up, getting it all ready. Kind of seems backwards because the guys don't do that today, right? <laughs> My wife would not want me setting up the house and saying, "Come on." Look what I've built for you. No, she would go, what is this? That doesn't match. This doesn't go here. What are you doing? You know, that would be my wife, which is okay because that's not my gifting. I mean, she asked me a lot too long ago, what do you think about this? I'm like, why do you ask me that question? Because you know I don't know. <laughs> and it's, it's almost like she asked me that question to do this. Okay, he doesn't like that. I know now that that's not the right one. So I'm going with this one, right? <laughs> so... He sets the house up, he gets it all ready, and then he goes to the bride's, the bride's house where she's living with that. And this is this big parade. This is this big thing. He goes, he picks them up, and then they begin to go back, like in, literally in a parade, because everybody that's invited is to have their torch or their lamp. And guess what? It's supposed to be lit. And so he comes, picks her up, and this procession goes back to the house that he made where they have the wedding ceremony, where they have the supper, the feast, and that kind of So it, it pictures what's going to happen when Christ returns. But watch this. If you didn't have a lamp or a torch that was lit and you were just in on the parade, when you got to the bridegroom's home, you wouldn't be allowed in. Are you following? You would be left out because you, could, you had to have a torch, you had to have a lamp, and it had to be lit to prove that you're part of the party, but you would not be admitted if those things weren't the case. And so you have these ten or these five that were foolish that weren't admitted into the wedding feast. Isn't that interesting? So when we see these things, it's important to go back into the Bible and kind of begin to understand the culture of the day so we get a bigger picture about what Jesus was talking about in this parable. So when we kind of proceed here, so let's take a look at these five foolish bridesmaids. So they, like the five wise, fell asleep. But here's the big difference between them falling asleep, right? They fell asleep unprepared. They had no oil for their lamp. They didn't have extra oil. Their lamp had nothing but a little flicker, and they were going to run out of oil real quick, so their light was going to run out, okay? So they fell asleep unprepared. I like it to this. They put off their ability to ask Christ into their heart. They had opportunities, but they just kept putting it off. They kept putting it off, which kept them in a place of being unprepared. So in essence, you could say this. The five foolish were procrastinators. They were procrastinators. They kept putting it off, and they kept putting it off. Let me ask you something. In your life, right now, what are some things that you procrastinate doing? Chores. Laundry. Vacuuming. Washing the car. Cleaning it out. Maybe you got some project at work you're supposed to do, but you keep putting it off. Usually we put things off because we really don't want to do it, or we just don't want to waste our time, or it's going to be too hard, right? And so we put it off. Do you know that 20% of the population classifies themselves as a chronic procrastinator? A chronic procrastinator would not make a good superhero, you know? It's like, what are they going to do, rip it open? And then you're not going to be able to read the word across their chest because it's too long. Procrastinator. Right? I am the procrastinator. Ah, uh, Wait, I'll get to that later. It doesn't work, right? The world needs to be saved. That doesn't work. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the procrastinator. And so 20% confess that they're chronic procrastinators, people who will always put things off for another day. But you know what is at the root of procrastination? Lying. To procrastinate, you have to lie to yourself that you can do it later. When you know, in fact, that you should do it today. 
Okay, so back in school, let me re rewind a lot of years. Back in school, I could not stand school. I didn't. I didn't like school at all. I liked advanced PE, where all the jocks ended up and we were playing sport games, right? The, our whole hour, right? I liked, uh, I liked being a teacher's aide. I liked accounting when I took accounting. Because I was back in the day, we were able to take classes that weren't like trig and all that stuff. Unless you wanted to, you had other options like accounting that counted as a math credit. So I didn't do, I did okay in school, but it wasn't something that I woke up in the morning, all right, I get to go learn today, right? So whenever I had an English paper, was like that was like the worst class, or I had a had a literature class. Those are like like you want to make me crawl and scream. That's it. But that would be the class. If I had a paper to write, that paper was going to get written at midnight the night before it's done. Because it was almost like, for those that don't like fingernails down the chalkboard, it, that's, like that, that's what that was for me. right? It was like grueling. It was agony. I don't want to do this. So I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off until the last moment. And then that's just pure H-E double toothpicks, right? Because now you're like all confused and stuff like that. And so procrast to, to procrastinate, you have to lie to yourself saying that you got time to do it later. Isn't that interesting? You got time to do it later. And one of the biggest things that, that uh, procrastination gets tied up into is distraction. You know, there's too many shiny lights now in the world today. There's too many things that are grabbing our attention here and grabbing our attention there and grabbing our attention here. Can I just say a few? Twitter, Facebook, the Internet, TV. We all have them, right? We all have things that are distractions. But the biggest thing to a procrastinator is they need distractions because it keeps making a reason why they can't do it now. And so we look at a world today, and I believe the devil uses distraction to get people to keep procrastinating to ask Christ into their heart. So they keep going day in, day, day in, day out, not realizing that this time of God's grace and his love and his mercy is getting shorter, and the time's coming to an end when judgment is coming. And you can't go buy oil when he's here. It's too late. Time has ended. Time is over for, for, that, for that grace to accept, accept him as Lord and Savior. And that's the reason why they were distracted. They had other things going on in their life. They had other things that they valued more important, so they didn't prepare themselves for his coming. And then we have the five wise Bridesmaids. And again, I said earlier, I believe these represent those that uh, have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But it's important to note that when Jesus said this parable, that they too fell asleep. They were prepared, but they, were, they, 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 they fell asleep. When did they fall asleep? While they were waiting. So waiting, has, waiting begs this thing where, 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 where there's things in our life where we have to wait. Sometimes it creates something in us called complacency. Anybody ever been complacent in your Christian walk? It's like a miserable death. And so here they fell asleep. They, they hear the scream, the, the, the yelling of, of the person who made the noise about the, the groom being uh, is coming and they got up, lit their lamp and were part of the, the parade back to the house. Isn't, it, isn't this a fascinating story? When you, when you start breaking it down, you start understanding it. So let me ask you this. How many would say this morning that, and you don't have to raise your hand, but maybe you just um, would say that you're the five wise Bright, bright, bridesmaids. How many would woo, give me woo? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I, I think I only got three out of there, so maybe we should skip towards the end. No. But, so, but here, I want to ask a very sobering question. How are you staying prepared? 
Have you become sleepy and relaxed in your waiting? Because we're all waiting for the same thing. So let's look at, uh, let's look at this. Jesus, uh, in Luke 12, 45 through 47, he's talking about another, uh, another parable. He says, but what if the, thir- the servant thinks, Ma- my master won't be back for a while. And he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. The master, will re- the, the master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut. I mean, this sounds really, this sounds really bad. The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. And a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. Now, I want you to understand something. I did not make that up. That's Jesus speaking. Okay, now it got real quiet in here. That's Jesus speaking. How many times do we in our own life as we're waiting, we get this thought in the back of our mind, well, Jesus is delayed. I've got time to fool around. I got time to return to a little bit of my old life I used to have. I got time. I can, I can mistreat people. I can lie. I can do this. I can do that. I've got time. So in essence, what we're doing is we're taking our lamps and we're dumping out the oil because we're unpreparing ourselves for his return. Are you hearing me today? Is this resonating in your heart today? The purpose of this parable that Jesus was talking about, about the 10 version, is staying in a place of preparation. Being a prodigal child myself growing up, had nothing to do with my folks, had everything to do with me. This is where I was at. I'm coming out of high school. Well, the Lord's delayed on his coming. Because you know, you grow up in the church and all you hear is, the Lord's coming back soon, the Lord's coming back. And th- the truth is, there's truth to that. <laughs> to, the Lord, to the Lord, one day to us is a thousand to him, right? So he is coming back soon. But the whole purpose are 10,000. Okay. So, so the purpose of all this is about staying in a place where our heart is always prepared and fighting the distractions, fighting the procrastinations, fighting f- from doing the things that we know we should do and starting to revert back to the things we know we shouldn't be doing. And so this verse here breaks it down. So in it, you know, you, we have a servant and that servant uh, is, is, is Christians. The master here is Jesus. So he came, he left, right? But in this time of delay, now they start mistreating one another. They start beating one another. They start partying. They start getting drunk. And I'm sure if, if Luke had more time, he would have just listed out all the other things that the New Testament talks about of fleshly living, right? And it's easy in today's world to get relaxed. It's easy in today's world to, to shrink back. It's easy in this world today to get complacent in our walk. Is this too hard? <laughs> Three people. Let me, uh, let me give you another, another scripture here. First Timothy, Paul, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. He says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, last days, some will turn away from true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their conscience are dead. Now understand something. Paul is speaking to people in the church here because he's addressing faith. If that, if Paul could see that happening, come on, if Paul could see that in the spiritual of that happening, what makes any of us think in this room today that we would be exempt from that temptation? Do you know all across America and the world today, there are messages going out from pulpit, pulpits that are not even biblical? It's a twisting of God's word. We've, we've redefined marriage, that God's very, is very clear on what marriage is. We've redefined it in, the, in some of the churches today, and it's going out across the, the, the waves 
uh, of the airwaves across the world. And people are, are beginning to believe things that aren't even true. And it's very clear in scripture. If we don't guard our heart, we will be deceived as well. Because you know, these deceptive spirits, they're very crafty. They know how to package. They know how to twist things where we go, oh, yeah, okay, well, God's love and God's grace. And so everything goes to God's love and God's grace. And God wouldn't, but God would. Come on. God, God wouldn't do it, but God would. We really actually live in some very sobering times in, in the world today when it comes to the word of God. People are trampling on it. People are making a mockery of it. And, he's, and people are making a mockery of Christianity. And they don't have any problem doing it. And you know what's the saddest thing is? Many of them are Christians. They're mocking what faith they used to have. And yet, if we don't guard and if we keep ourselves in a place of being prepared, we will get deceived just like those that are already deceived in the world today. Paul also said this in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. He said this, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will, will, own, will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoff, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the, the power that could actually make them godly. And Paul says, stay away from people like that. Can I ask you a question? See, I told you this was going to be hard today. Can I ask you a question? I've been in the church a long time, even in my hypocrisy. I was, even, I was smart enough to know I should go to church, right? But here's the thing. Do you know that much of what was just read there is in the church today? And I don't think Paul's actually really addressing the church. I think he's addressing the world. But much of that is in the church today. People are lovers of themselves. People are lovers of money. You can just go through that whole list. Show me a kid that's not in high school that's not disobedient to their parents. I was never <laughs> disobedient to my parents growing up. I always listened to everything they said. Watch what you say, Mom and Dad. Now, it's interesting that Paul says at the end to stay away from people such as this. But can I say this? Let's not say that we're supposed to separate ourselves from the world and never be in the world. No, I think what Paul is saying, don't, don't give those people access into your life. Because we are called to go out to people just like that. And we're supposed to bring the light and love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ to them. Okay, so it's not like, oh, the church has now got to shrink back and it's just got to get back around that campfire where we're singing Kumbaya and it's nothing about us and that's all that matters. That's not what God's heart is. That's not what Paul was saying. But you don't allow those types of people to have influence over your life. You know, it's easy to play church. It's easy to play church. The reason I say it is because I've done it. I did it. Nobody would have known. I was good at playing church. But inside I was an empty shell. And that's not God's best for us. Come on, that's not God's best for us. So why does God delay now? It's not to punish us. <laughs> like, I was just up there going, I'm going to punish them, I'm going to wait However, delay does reveal our heart. Are you following me? In delay, it actually reveals our heart. It's not to torture us or make us miserable. 2 Peter 3, 14 through 15 sheds light on why God delays at this time. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. So God delays 
because his heart is to see everybody come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why he's in a delay place. That's why he's, because he loves so much that he doesn't want to see anybody go to hell. He loves so much that he's giving and exhausting every avenue for everybody to have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, whether or not they're procrastinating, whether or not they're slumbering, whether or not they, he's giving time for everybody, but he's also giving time for the church now, currently, to assess your own life and go, Lord, I'm not prepared. I've allowed compromise to come into my life. I've allowed things to come into my life that I'm not in the place today that I was six months ago or or a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. Come on. He gives us time to get it all right, to, to, to get back into a loving relationship with him. That's why he delays. It's not like he's thinking, man, I can't wait to come back so I can send five billion people to hell. That is not his heart. But it reveals our heart when we go, Lord, I just wish you would wrap this up. A heart that says, I want you to just wrap this up because we really want to escape isn't a heart that's in line with his heart because he wants to see all people get saved. So think about people that you know right now that don't know Christ. God desires them to be saved. You're in their life for a reason. Not just to see them, not just to say hi. You're in their life for a, me- for a reason because he wants to see them saved. And he's placed you in their life to help make that happen. See, there's work to be done while we're waiting. It's not, it's not like God saying, okay, I'm delaying. I'm not doing this to punish you or anything like that, but it's going to reveal your heart, right? It's, it's not like he's saying, oh, and then we just sit back like, what was that, what was that, uh, w- that movie, Wally? Was it Wally? Where they all sat up in, in space on these big, was it Wally? Okay. Where they sat up there their whole life and all they did was just get fatter and fatter. All they did was eat, eat, eat. Everything was about ease. Everything was about n- nothing difficult. And that's what their life became. That's not our life now as believers. We actually have some things God wants us to accomplish. God actually wants to partner with you and he wants to partner with me. And he, he wants the church all across the, w- the world to partner with him to reach out and see the lost get saved. That's why he delays. But so many times the church isn't engaged in what God's delaying for. We're engaged to go, I want more money. I want more time off. I want to do this. I want to do that. So we're living our life in the moment for ourselves. And God has this plan for the church to accomplish. And we're not even engaged with it because we're too busy living for the moment. Come on. We are called to be prepared at all times. How many have ever watched The Prepper Show? The Prepper Show. Okay, so The Prepper Show is a show where people are preparing for worldwide calamity, okay? And so they're the ones that build the bomb shelters in their backyard. They're the ones that put a year's worth of food back. Do we have any preppers here? I just want to know so I know where to come. No. <laughs> So they spend all this time, money, and energy to, to build their, their underground forts and stuff like that, stock them. So they're preparing for some calamity to hit the world or to hit their house or to hit their state or our nation or whatever, right? They're preparing for that. But you know what that preparing doesn't accomplish? It doesn't prepare them for Christ's return. And even if there was a calamity that happened in, in, let's just say, our nation and all these preppers were there, odds are they're going to die anyways, right? If, there's, if, if it's nuclear, it's going to be done and over with. If it's all over the United States, you're not going to be able to come out of your bunker for decades, right? They're going to die anyways. So they prepared themselves for some calamity, but they didn't prepare themselves for Christ's return. Sounds kind of crazy. You know, many times we prepare ourselves for a lot of things in life. A lot of times we're not preparing things for the right things. You know, we don't need to prepare ourselves for calamity in this world, right? Fear makes us prepare. Trust in God says, Lord, you're in control and whatever happens, you've authorized. And if you've authorized things to happen where I'm going to experience calamity, then by gosh, by golly, my time was up and I'm with you. But in the meantime, we still have work to do. In the meantime, we still have things that God desires us to do. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 
So for us today, it doesn't mean stockpiling food. It doesn't mean being those types of preppers. It's for us to, to be prepared and to be engaged in the things of God's kingdom. So let me give you nine quick things that we are uh, that we're supposed to produce while we're waiting, and they're real simple. Um, I'm going to rattle them off, um, and then we'll we'll get ready to close here. So number one, we need to stay close to Jesus through prayer, reading, and studying His Word. Because remember, this is all about a relationship with our Savior. It's not about saying a prayer and then just living your life however you want to. It's about a relationship. He desires a relationship with you, and he wants us to desire a relationship with him. We, never, we need to develop an ever-increasing relationship with the Holy Spirit. Are you guys ready for this? Do you know our relationship right now isn't with Jesus? We learn about him because when we see him in Scripture, we see God. But our relationship is actually with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us. Jesus right now, he's actually up in heaven, sitting next to the Father, and he's praying and interceding for you. That's what he's doing. And I love this because when we pray, God releases angels to do his work. But our relationship right now is with the Holy Spirit. And how important is it in today's world that we have a relationship that's growing with the Holy Spirit so we know his voice, so we can say, whoa, 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 that would be a good time to make, take this U-turn because the direction you're going to is going to lead to your destruction. And I'm here to make sure you don't go to your destruction. Come on. We have a relationship that needs to be developed with the Holy Spirit and we learn about it, about Jesus and God through reading the word of God. We need to allow God's grace in our life to change us in the, to his image, not keep us in our old nature. Okay, God's given us gr- his grace not to keep us the same, but to change us. Come on, to change us into his image. We need to walk in holiness, godliness, and righteousness. Not words you would hear a whole lot anymore in America. That God actually, because of his grace, expects us to live a certain way. Can I say that this morning? God's grace empowers us to walk in godliness, holiness, and righteousness. Come on. So we've got to learn to allow that grace to have its work in our life. We've got to allow God's grace to have its work in our life. We need to model his love to those around us. Remember, most of the world today is looking for a church that will model God's unconditional love. Remember, we're in a season where God is giving opportunity for the lost to come in to to his kingdom. But they're going to see God many times through how we love. We need to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Um, Number seven, being a shining light in darkness that's in the world. Now's not the time, church, to put our our, 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 uh, light under a bush or under a a basket. Now's the time to remove it and let your light shine. Come on. The world's actually looking for light in the darkness. And can I say this? The enemy has a faulty light out there. And the church has a real light. Be a part of God's kingdom and working with him in seeing the lost become saved, number eight. And then number nine, being a part of his church. Okay, be a part of his church, not just attending, but taking ownership. There's something happens when we take ownership in the church that we go to. Something happens. We care more. If we're just attending, it's really easy to come and go. But when we really care, we take ownership, we get plugged in, we get involved, we get involved with people, we share life together. That is a model of sticking it out in tough times, when tough times come. You and I both need need people in our life that we can go to when we're struggling. Come on. Too many Christians are doing it alone, and they get knocked off by the devil. God never asked us to walk this alone. He asked us to walk with him on one side and brothers and sisters in Christ on the other. 